to About Face Theatre presents five questions with, and today's guest, Paula Vogel. Paula is one of the most significant American playwrights working today. Her plays include Indecent, um, How I Learned to Drive, The Long Christmas Ride Home, Hot and Throbbing, and The Baltimore Waltz, among others. Her awards include every major award for American playwriting, the Pulitzer, the Tony, the Obie, the Drama Desk, the Lortel, not to mention uh, an American, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Dramatist Guild and induction into the American Theatre Hall of Fame among a multitude of honors. Her work has been produced uh, in New York at theatres such as Second Stage, New York Theatre Workshop, and uh, the Vineyard, uh, across America, at the likes of uh, the Goodman, Circle Rep, and Woolly Mammoth, and internationally from the Donmar in London to versions in translation from Argentina to Taiwan. In addition, Paula has devoted much of her career to education, mm -hmm. including founding and running the playwriting program at Brown University from 1984 to 2008, uh, including uh, starting there a workshop with women in maximum security prison that continues to this day. Paula's teaching ranges from four years as the chair of Yale Drama to guiding playwriting intensives across the globe. Paula, you are very welcome. Thank you so much. And just to say, you know, when you when you rattle off that that list of accomplishments, I realize how much bribe money I've been paying out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it it's adds up, you know. <laughs> in fact, deductible expense, Paula. Yeah, well, so so happy to be with you. Yeah, great. So, Paula, we're going to just jump right in. So, okay. can you tell us about um, the play or your first experience that got you into theater? Absolutely. So, um, I grew up uh, below the poverty line, mm -hmm. um, and so there was no money for clothing or restaurants or theater. Um, mm -hmm. So I wasn't exposed to theater until my first year in high school. Mm -hmm. And my parents had gone through a very dysfunctional, disruptive divorce, and I had no money to get out of the house. But by good fortune, I stumbled into a theater class when mm -hmm. I was in 10th grade. Just mm -hmm. didn't know what it was, stumbled into the room, and the teacher saw me come in. I came in late, and he said, just sit down and be quiet, and you can stay. <laughs> and they started a reading of a play I'd never heard about called The Skin of Our Teeth by mm -hmm. Thornton Wilder. That was the first play. And mm -hmm. I didn't move an inch from that seat. And by the end of the play reading, I thought, I have to stay in this room the rest of my life. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. um, I went up to the teacher. I said, can you please use me in some way? And I think he knew just looking at me that, you know, I probably couldn't act my way out of a paper bag. And he was right about that. <laughs> but he said, we need a stage manager. And I said, what the heck is that? <laughs> so at age, whatever it was, 13 or 14, I became the stage manager for all of the shows that we did in high school. And I spent just about every evening outside my dysfunctional living room gathering this family mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of colleagues that we would give each other the shirts off our back, regardless mm -hmm. of what we were producing. Mm -hmm. It was this notion of us together as a collective that mm -hmm. actually gave me tools to survive a public, a large public high school, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we did everything from the sound of music to Edward Albee, to just, you know, really interesting work. Um, mm -hmm. It was a bro broad spectrum. And I tried to get into, uh, uh, we had no money for college. I, I tried to get into theater school, but back then mm -hmm. you could only get into theater school were you an actress, mm -hmm. using that word actress. Mm -hmm. No thought of women my age back then being playwrights, certainly not being directors. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of, it took me many, many years to figure out mm -hmm. how to keep in the room. And mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of how I began. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Fantastic. Okay, Paula. So uh, you're talking there about the influence of uh, Skin of Our Teeth and that, in that first room. But what's, what's a great play that you love and why? 
I'm going to tell you something that um, I've just started an initiative uh, mm. because I've been working with brilliant playwrights for the last 40 years. Mm. And my favorite playwrights, when I, when I say their names, may not be known. Mm. Yes, five of my former students have won the Pulitzer Prize. That's mm. true. Mm. But I'm talking about working with nine or 10 writers a year for 40 years. Mm. So many of the brilliant writers that I love mm. are not known. Mm. They do not get produced. They either leave the field, go into television writing, make money, mm -hmm. or they go back to law school. And I have to tell you, it's an excruciating pain. It's bad enough when your own work takes a long, long time to get on. Mm -hmm. But when you see a talented 30-year-old or 25-year-old who is lighting the world on fire, to watch mm -hmm. them languish has been hell. Mm -hmm. I have many, many favorite plays. My favorite play right now is a play called Good Goods by Christina Anderson. Christina Anderson um, has written a bit for television. She is uh, writing the book right now on a Broadway bound musical, but she's in her late thirties. And if you ask me, I would say Christina Anderson is writing plays every bit as vital and important as August Wilson. Mm -hmm. And she has a complete canon that makes mm -hmm. us look at race and gender and history in a mm -hmm. remarkable way. So what I'm finding about the American theater is that the plays that I love in some way face censorship. Mm -hmm. It's a benign censorship by theater companies deciding what will we produce? Where does the money go? Most of the writers that I think are brilliant are given stage readings and workshops. Yeah. This is hideous. Mm -hmm. And this is the world we live with. So I'm just shouting this out there. Good mm -hmm. Goods, written by Christina Anderson. Um, I have gone from theater to theater company with this script and many scripts, any script by Christina Anderson. And, mm -hmm. you know, she is an African-American queer writer. How many ways can we find to erase the identities that we desperately need to put on our stages? Um, by the way, she wrote the play as something I call a bake-off, something I've been doing for 40 years. In every mm -hmm. workshop with directors and writers, and also with community members, uh, I, I did this with a, a group of 100 veterans uh, two weeks ago. We get in the room, we do some short exercises, and then we all write the same play in 48 hours. So I'll give a list of ingredients like, okay, we're going to write the St. Joan Bake Off. Your play must have, and you must write it in 48 hours, a girl in a field, convincing higher authority, a visitation of an angel, a philosophical defense of cross-dressing, and a match. Well, <laughs> Christina Anderson wrote the first act of Good Goods in 48 hours on my uh, possession bake-off based on the Dybbuk and based on horror movies where one's body is taken over by the oh. undead. And I came up with a list of ingredients. She stumbled in with that first act in 48 hours and all of us, there were 25 of us around the table, we stopped breathing. We turned on her en masse and said, when can you finish this play? Now, here's the thing. I don't want to go on. I'm turning 70. I don't want to go on in my life. Mm -hmm. Knowing that many of my playwrights are becoming Georg Buchner, who wrote a play when he was a medical student in the, in the 18th century as a 24-year-old died of tuberculosis the next year, and then his manuscript is discovered in an attic 124 years later. Shame on us. Later, perhaps I'll, I'll tell you uh, what we've started to try and address this problem. I love it. Ooh. That sounds great. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you talked a little bit there about you know, something that um, is surprising, right? These great plays that 
don't actually get produced. But you, can you tell us anything about um, something in your theater life uh, that turned out differently than you expected it to? Uh, I wrote a, a little play in two weeks. I, I made a list of elements, just like any Bake Off. Mm. And I actually gave that list of elements to my graduate writers after I'd finished the play in two weeks. And the play I wrote because another play that I was supposed to write fell through. Mm. I'd gotten this residency. I ended up in Alaska. Everyone lined up to greet me on the plane. And they said, where's Cherry Jones? I was going to write a play for her about a castrato by the name of Farinelli, done all the research for two years. At the last mo moment, Sherry got this great role on Broadway that made her career um, in The Heiress that won her a Tony Award. So I showed up and everyone's like, where's Sherry? And I'm like, I think I have another idea for a play. Let's not panic. Just <laughs> give me a, a writing space and a supply of cigars, which ever since I played Killing of Sister George, um, as an undergraduate, I had to learn to smoke cigars. And I do find out that if you're having problems writing one cigar, you'll get through the night. So, <laughs> have my box of cigars, have this residency for two weeks, go in, and it's Alaska in the summer, so there's no, it's only daylight. Mm -hmm. There is no darkness, really. So it was like writing in the middle of, of, of the day all, all 24 hours. And in two weeks time, I came out with a draft of a play called How I Learned to Drive. Now, we did the first reading at this Alaskan theater company. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna get killed. They're gonna kill me. They are absolutely gonna stone me in the room. And when the reading was over, there was a moment of silence in the room. I thought, oh my God, they're, they're, they hate me. They just hate me. This is undefensible. And it took a moment for the artistic director said, congratulations, this will run forever. Well, you know, I figured they love me. <laughs> I had not had a production in New York for years. I'd only had one production and that was the Baltimore Waltz. Um, my agent sent it around and a lot of people called my agent back and said, your client needs psychiatry. <laughs> this is a very sick play. Mm. Um, what the hell is this play? This, we don't know who these characters are. We don't know what they do for a living. We can't possibly mm. produce this play. And I had just been on the phone with my agent weeping because yeah. I'd had a conversation with the um, literary manager of New York Theater Workshop who said, oh dear, how can I help you? This isn't a play, how can I help you? And I said, could you send the play back? And I hung up the phone, burst into tears, thought, well, I've experienced worse, you know, being a caretaker for my brother dying of AIDS, come on Vogel. Mm -hmm. And I got on the line with my agent who said, let me send it to an artistic director at the Vineyard Theater. Mm -hmm. Doug Abel had never met him. Mm -hmm. 24 hours later, my phone rang and Doug Abel said, Paula, I want to do your play. We have a gap, a play fell out. We need to go in rehearsal. This was in November, in January. I would like to do a workshop so we can figure out the acting, but do not think the workshop is an audition. Mm -hmm. you, it's all here on the page. I've never experienced anything like that in my career. Two months later, I was there calling my family saying, hey, this play is coming out. Just got to tell you faster than I thought. But it was still the same sensation. I thought I was going to be killed. I thought I was going to be killed by the critics. They'd always killed me before. Um, I thought audiences were going to just stream out of the theater. And so that was a surprise. You know, there's something really nice about desperation in playwriting. In our artist career, desperation is necessary because at some point you think they're not going to do me. I'm not going to be cast. They're not going to allow me to direct in this theater. I have nothing to lose. Mm. So I might as well put it all out there. Somebody will discover it in an attic 124 years from now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Paula. So, um, You've already done so much in the theater. I, you know, I listed like a fraction of what you've done in your bio. 
But so what, what keeps you coming back to the theater? What, what moves you, what excites you about theater? My colleagues. Mm. The thing that stopped me from leaving the theater were my students. Mm. The ability, I raised money so that the MFA at Brown University was free and mm. every playwright got tuition to teach freshmen. So mm. I could find a Nilo Cruz, mm. right? Um, I could find a Sarah Rule. I could find people who were working three jobs and say, here's the MFA. The only thing I ask of you is that you teach 18 year olds mm -hmm. honestly and lovingly and write your brains out. And I will produce in some form everything you write. We did about 120 stage readings over the course of every year. We did cabarets, we did bake-offs. I produced nine plays a year. And to be able to stand in the back and see, for example, Martina Mayock's first production and watch what happened in her body, right? Mm -hmm. I produced the first play that Lynn Nottage ever wrote. And to see an audience, how they were transformed. Those are experiences. Now it's interesting in the field, Everyone in New York went, oh, she's a professor, she's a teacher, she's a, she's a blue stocking. That's not really producing. That's not really being in the theater. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is silly and stupid. The fact that I know plays work on $200, which was what everyone's budget was, mm -hmm. with student and community actors in a two-week uh, rehearsal period, shame on you, Lincoln Center, if you can't produce this play on $300,000, <laughs> shame on you, I know it works. Yeah. So I think that it stopped me from being cynical. It stopped me from, from giving up. I thought, well, I have to keep writing because they're writing, so I have to keep up with them. I have to soak in everything they've shown me they can do and try to process that in the next play, whether or not my plays get done. I have to keep honest. I have to stay in the field because I have had the immense honor of tracking some of my writers for 40 years. Um, and knowing that in this next year, I'm, I read about two to 400 scripts a year. I'll be finding writers that I have to reach out to, to say, mm -hmm. teach me how you do this. Let me learn. How can I see your work? Now, I no longer run an MFA program and I don't run a theater company, but um, I am really happy. I think I should have been an agent. I'm happy <laughs> to call up artistic directors and literary managers and say, there is a script. I can't sleep because I've read it. Mm. Would you please read this play? Um, so it's, it's really, it's a, I think those of us who remain are driven. We know we don't earn a living. We have mm -hmm. to figure out how to subsidize our career. Mm -hmm. But who the heck wants to leave the room once you've had one good experience in the room? Now, if people are toxic in a theater, mm. I'm sorry, there's no excuse for you. Get out of the field, get out of this theater. I will never be in a room with you. Do not treat artists that way. How dare you? How dare mm -hmm. you? That is unforgivable. This mm -hmm. is our spiritual daily bread. Do not spit on the food that nourishes us. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Mm. So speaking of, you know, being in the room and you're already, you know, speaking about so much about like, you know, learning from students and learning, you know, from all, all different aspects, you know, is, is there a tool, something you, that you've learned throughout your time in theater that you have found useful in um, non-theater times, the, 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 the non-theater life? Well, I know that it is very difficult for me not to work collectively. It's very difficult for me to do something where I can't say the word, the, the word we, W-E. Because I think theater, like the military, 
-hmm. you realize you're only as good as the entire group. Um, and that has been a godsend to let audience members and board members and donors know that they're not ju just giving money, they're becoming part of the we. Mm -hmm. We are doing this, we have to do this together. There is no sense of individuality, there is the sense of all artists mm -hmm. lifting up the individual's voices. So mm -hmm. I think that that helps. The other thing that I think helps enormously is that I've learned how to be incredibly visible and vulnerable. I learned from actors and directors. If you're in a room and you take a zipper to your skin and unzip your body and you open up and show me your viscera on stage as you are acting, that ah, damn, I better do the same thing in the room. Here's the zipper. I'm going to unzip myself. If there are students, if there are young artists, if there's someone in the room who's giving me that, I want to be completely open and vulnerable and visible. But the second someone is not worthy of my trust, and this is the most important thing that I want to teach younger artists, it's not you. It's not your fault. Do not take in that negativity and that toxicity. Zip it back up. I know how to smile politely. Mm -hmm. I know how to say, ooh, interesting point. Let me think about that. Mm -hmm. And then I go home and I take a shower. And I save my vulnerability for the people who have given me theirs, who deserve it. Mm -hmm. Really important lesson. Well, Paula, wow. This has just <laughs> been quite amazing. So thank you so much. Um, as a as as a bonus question, can you tell us anything about what you're working on at the moment? I certainly can. Mm -hmm. um, I am writing a memoir. I am writing a new play. I have another play on the way. However, <laughs> since COVID, when COVID struck and all of the productions of Indecent were canceled, mm -hmm. um, I thought, you know, I might die from COVID. What mm -hmm. plays have I never seen that I love that I have to see before I die? So I had a remaining $10,000 from my last royalties of Indecent, and I started Bard at the Gate. And what we did were readings that we put on Zoom of a first season of these amazing plays. And I only could show it for four nights on Zoom, but I showed it, I introduced it. Um, actors and directors, you know, for car fare gave me 20 hours and we got 11,000 viewers. This year, I've gone around with my hat in hand to people and said, can you give money? Because we have to pay artist living wages. Every penny that I've earned is going into wages for the artists, the stage managers, uh, the producers, the uh, video artists who are editing. And we have just released a play that has not been produced. And I am outraged because it is brilliant and dangerous and gorgeous written by an African-American woman, Zakia Alexander. Now, we have to charge for tickets, but the first night will always, always be free. Last night was our first night. Uh, How to Raise a Freeman, you can watch it at www.mccarter.org slash Bard. Name of the series is Bard at the Gate. This play is How to Raise a Freeman. Next is a play by the incredible Jose Rivera, Sonnets for an Old Century that has not been produced in New York. After that, Lusa, Loitza, who wrote The Chinese Lady, were doing his Charlie Chan detective play that is wild and hysterical and crazy. And then lastly, uh, a British playwright who is now emigrated to America, who I describe as a 21st century, Carol Churchill. Mm. Dibika Guha, why the hell is she not done in every theater mm. Mm. In, in London, in Britain? Mm. I have no idea. She wrote a gorgeous play called Passing. So if you go online to www, you want to see something different? By the way, Kwame, um, I've lost touch since he left center stage, but boy, I would love Kwame. I have to figure out a way how to send, how to raise a Freeman to him. Um, 
We will have a third season as well. I'm trying to see if I can find enough foundation money and donors and um, money from the ticket sales to produce the third season and the fourth season, because the truth of the matter is, is I'm tired of waiting for theater companies and not for profits to do the right things. We as artists, we the collective, we as audiences, if you're an audience member, you're an artist. You are in our community. Watch Bard at the Gate. Write me and tell me what you think. Um, we have a national advisory committee uh, of diverse artists who are doing the same struggle. If you have a play, let us know about it. Mm -hmm. um, this has to stop. Um, so uh, it's with great joy and pleasure that I tell you, we just launched our first play, How to Raise a Freeman. It's extraordinary. Please go watch it. Please, please, please. Yeah. So and the writers on the side. Oh, Pardon? Sorry, go ahead. It's available worldwide. It's available whenever you have the time to watch it. For the entire season, these four plays will start to run in repertory. And actually we're trying to figure out a platform. All of the money goes into the artist's salary. I'm not interested in monetizing other artists' work, you know? So what if we actually did what not for profits are supposed to do? Pay your staff, pay your artists. <laughs> we don't have to pay for bricks and mortars. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. There's the great thing. And the other thing that we all know is we better enter the 21st century. In Ireland and in uh, uh, England, I still call it England, um, mm -hmm. and in Germany, mm -hmm. theater is much, much further along than the capitalist United States. Mm -hmm. We must release our archives. It must be accessible to school children. It should be accessible at any point that you want to watch it. I think the ability to watch theater in your schools, libraries, and living rooms increases the demand to see live theater. Mm -hmm. Instead of acting in this proprietary way. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is mine, my precious. Um, <laughs> let's, stop, let's stop producing as golems and just mm. give the ring away, you know? Mm. Anyway, mm. here we are. Wow. Thank you for your questions. I love it. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your answer. It's such a delight to have you. Oh, you. I'm, I'm always excited to talk to artists. And listen, mm. I just know that About Face will flourish. Um, we're, we're going through this interesting challenge, but it makes it even more precious yeah. that you produce. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Thank you. And thank you to you, the audience for joining us as well. Um, if you enjoyed the interview, please like below and follow about face and share because we believe theater makes life better. See you next time on About Face Theater presents five questions with. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe to us on YouTube, like us on Facebook and share. Thanks for watching.